Here is what I'll be covering tonight during the workshop. I'm going to talk a little bit about plant names. We're going to talk about plant identification and we'll review some of the really common plants in Metro Vancouver. I'll talk about how to safely and sustainably collect plants. And then I have lots of resources to share. Um, again, remember that the video is being recorded and so you'll have access to this afterwards. I'll provide you the link along with the links that I'll share during the presentation. It's really hard to capture them from the screen. So I'll include all of those links for you in the follow-up message that I send. And then we'll have time at the end for your questions. So let's start with what's in a plant name. So actually plants have lots of different kinds of names. Um, one of the most common ones that scientists like me use is the scientific name. So there are two parts to a plant scientific name. There's the first part, which is called a genus, and the second um, part, which is called um, the, oh my gosh, Isabel, I'm forgetting the name, the genus and the species. Um, and the species that I'm focusing on here is Western red cedar. The scientific name for Western red cedar is Buya plicata. So you can see the name written there. Generally, when scientific names are written out, they're italicized and the genus is capitalized and the species name is not. Um, and each plant will have a very unique scientific name. And sometimes there'll even be some words after the scientific name to distinguish it from really closely related species. And of course, we also have English common names for many different plants. So the plant again on the screen is Western red cedar. And there can actually be lots of different common names for plants. So Western red cedar also sometimes called Pacific red cedar or giant cedar. And of course, there are also local or indigenous names for plants. So the Squamish Nation language actually has a number of different words for the Western red cedar. I don't know how to pronounce them, but they're there on the screen. Um, and sometimes indigenous cultures um, are so heavily dependent on the plants. They know them so well, and they have different names for different parts of the plants and different ways that they're being used. And so they often have way more sophisticated ways of naming plants um, than is common in the English language or even the scientific language. So when you're learning how to identify plants, there are a number of different things that you can observe when you're in nature to help you figure out what a plant might be. The first is you might want to pay attention to where it's growing. So I mentioned that some of you might be from further away from Metro Vancouver. And so some of the plants I talk about tonight might not even be found in your region. So if you're trying to identify a plant and you realize that it's not even found in your neighborhood or in your country or on your continent, then that's a pretty good clue that it's not the right plant. Um, many plants only grow on certain places on the earth. And so it's important to know um, what kind of plants grow where you're growing. That can really help you narrow down the list of things that your plant could be. So knowing where the plant is located on earth is important and also where it's growing. Some aquatic plants only grow in habitats that are wet. So maybe uh, alongside a pond or beside a river. And so you wouldn't find those plants in other types of locations. So the, the type of habitat or the site where the plant is growing can be a really good clue as well. The growth pattern is really important. Is it growing along the ground or is it a tree? Those are really great clues, again, to help you narrow down. The overall size of the plant is important. Sometimes um, people send me photos wanting me to help them identify a plant. And if I don't know the scale of the photo, it's really hard for me to tell, is the leaf they're showing me the size of my hand or is the leaf the size of my, my arm? You know, So the size of plant also matters. You can see the woman in the photo there standing next to a really tall plant. That's one of the identifying features of that plant, which is called giant hogweed, is it's a really tall plant when it's flowering. The leaves and the flowers and also the fruits or the seeds of the plant are also really important um, when you're trying to identify plants. Also the underground structures. We don't often have access to what's underground. If you're collecting plants, then you might be able to see what's underground um, and those structures can also help you. So this is a really busy slide, but this is an a uh, glossary or a description of all the different types of leaves that are out there. So there's different arrangements of leaves and there's different shapes of leaves. 
Um, there's in the middle of the screen, you can see it says leaf margin. So the edges of the leaves can be very descriptive. Um, and so paying attention, paying really close attention to what leaves look like can really help you get good at plant identification. And, and leaves more than any of the other structures we'll talk about are often on the plant a little bit longer. And so there are often features that you really have to depend on. Um, if a plant doesn't have a flower or a seed or a berry, then if you only have the leaves to look at, it's important to know what some of those features are. And there are also different arrangements of flowers. So these are different examples of types of flowers that um, you can find. So a spike flower in the top left is a, a type of inflorescence. It's called a, a type of flower arrangement where you have uh, flowers growing from the bottom first and then you have more and more flowering towards the top. Um, and then you have different ways that they can be arranged on the plant. And this is also really helpful. If you, if you have access to a flower, flowers are always really helpful to identify plants and knowing how they're arranged is really helpful. If you're lucky enough to find fruits or seeds, those are also very distinguishing for plants. Um, so some of the things that are listed there might be familiar to you, um, a berry or a palm, Home is a type of fruit that comes from an apple. Um, and so there's different ways that seeds um, grow in fruits and knowing what that is can be really helpful. Um, so there are the fleshy fruits and then there are the dry fruits as well. Um, some of them have very lovely names. Samaras down at the bottom left are the name for the seeds that come from maple trees. So they're those seeds that if you throw them up into the air and they twist around like helicopters, they'll slowly um, float to the ground. Um, we've got schizocarps, silicles and silics are really, really cool names there. And if you get really into plants, um, once you can identify what type of seed comes from a certain plant, you'll be able to identify plants down to plant family. So if you take a botany class, what you'll usually learn is how to identify different families of plants. So just like families of people, families of plants are plants that are really closely related. And usually they have the same types of flowers and the same types of seeds in each plant family. And so that can really help, um, help get you better at plant identification as well. All right, so before we get into what some of the different species are that are local in our neighborhood, I want to talk about what an invasive species is, because that's a big part of what I do in my job is teach people about invasive species and what to do about them. Um, so invasive species are, are a very small group of living things um, that are from somewhere else on Earth. They've been moved to a new habitat, a new place on Earth, and in that new habitat, they're causing some significant harm. Maybe they're doing environmental damage, maybe they're harmful for human health, or maybe they're just uh, causing economic problems. Maybe they're destroying um, houses or infrastructure, or maybe they're just really costly to manage. Um, and all of the species shown in the screen there are examples of invasive species. So even though we're focusing on plants today, um, actually any living thing can be invasive, but we certainly have our share of invasive plants and we'll talk about some of those today. What is a weed? Sometimes um, people use the word weed and invasive plant interchangeably. My definition of a weed is a bit broader than an invasive plant. An invasive plant is um, generally a, a regulated species or a species that you know, we're really concerned about because it's so damaging. Um, a weed is generally something where uh, something's growing where you don't want it to grow. And so there's a bit of cultural value to that. Um, what I consider a weed on my property might be different than what you would consider a weed on your property. Um, and it, it could be more than just an invasive plant. Sometimes people don't want certain things growing on their property because they don't like the look of it or for whatever reason, it's not something that they want to maintain. Um, and so lots of things that we see in nature would fall under the category of, of weed as well. So next I'd like to review some of the most common plants that you will see in the Metro Vancouver area. So again, it really does matter where you live. If you don't live in Metro Vancouver, some of these species might not be found in your neighborhood. So it's really important to know, um, you know where you're from and what plants are found locally there. 
I'm going to start with knotweed, which is one of our highest priority invasive plants to deal with. You may have seen it around. This species will grow almost anywhere in back lanes, in front yards, um, next to concrete, um, or in parks and natural areas as well. And there are actually a number of different knotweed species that we have growing in Metro Vancouver, but they all look pretty similar. They kind of look a little bit like bamboo. They're not a type of bamboo, but they kind of look like it. They have hollow stems. You can see the photo there of somebody who's got knotweed, which would be very unwanted on their property because knotweed can actually damage people's foundations. You can see it's growing next to a downspout there. Um, and so having knotweed growing next to those things is not a great thing that property owner would want to be seeking some help in order to get rid of the knotweed there. Um, knotweed is really damaging and it spreads also really, really easily. And so there are specific techniques that we have to use in order to manage it because some things work um, and some things don't work. Um, but this is a very, very common plant that you'll see frequently throughout every local government, every city in Metro Vancouver. And it's a high priority plant for everybody to be working on. One of our really prized native plants is Salau. And this is a, a lovely shrub. You'll find it in the understory or um, on the lower part of the forest. And um, you can see the photo on the right there. You can see the Salau berries that have formed. They're not quite ripe yet. When they ripen, they'll get a little bit um, darker, sort of a purplish black. Um, and the berries are actually edible. Um, some people don't like the taste because it's a little bit bitter compared to some other berries, but it, it definitely is edible. Um, Salau was used by First Nations people. Um, it's even used today in flower arrangements and, and things like that. So it's a, a lovely plant that stays green all year round. So the leaves um, would be identifiable at any time of year, you'll, you'd be able to, to find this plant. Himalayan blackberry is another one of our invasive plants. It's probably the most common invasive plant that we have growing in Metro Vancouver. Um, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this one. So it grows in these big thickets. So it starts out from a seed and then it forms these branches that kind of grow in swooping canes. And then if the end of the stem actually reaches the ground, it can uh, root into the ground again. And so you sort of have this effect where you have uh, thickets growing over top of it, each other and you get these huge um, places where blackberry is really the dominant or only species at a site. Um, blackberry really likes to grow in full sun so you often see them on the outsides of parks or on the edges of properties that's really where they love to grow. Um, you can see in the photo there they're the light pink flower and then of course in the summertime usually July, August, September they produce a prolific amount of blackberries that people love to eat. And I encourage people to collect blackberries um, because that means there are less blackberry seeds falling to the ground that could grow into new plants. So super, super common species. I'm, I'm positive that you have seen this. In fact, many of us could look out the windows from where we are and probably see a blackberry plant right now. Salmonberry is a native plant and it's kind of similar to Himalayan blackberry in that it does produce edible berries. Um, it's a bit of a smaller plant. It doesn't have thorns as big as Himalayan blackberry, but this has very, very small kind of spines. You can see in the photo there that the, the leaves um, usually have three parts to them. So there's a part at the top and then two parts at the bottom. That's very distinctive for salmonberry. And it's a great time of year to be looking for salmonberry out in parks and natural areas because they've just started flowering. So beautiful, beautiful pink or fuchsia flowers look just like that. And then the berries will come um, along in a few months. Really important species for our wildlife. Our wildlife really depend on native plants, not only for um, for habitat, for nesting, but also for food. And salmonberry is a really important species for many different uh, wildlife. English holly is another really common shrub in our region, although it can get to be a tree size. So oftentimes, um, you see on private property or in parks these really large holly trees. 
So holly has leaves that are thick and waxy and they also have sharp spines along the edges. So you have to be really careful if you're walking or working in an area that has English holly. Um, it is invasive. It is starting to take over um, many of our forest ecosystems and it can be really damaging to the environment in a number of different ways. Um, interesting thing about this plant is that uh, the male plants um, are separate from the female plants. So they're um, oftentimes plants have male and female parts together in the same plant, but this plant, the male and female plants are actually separate. Um, and you can see here, you know, we have a plant that has uh, berries. So this would be um, a female plant that had been pollinated and then berries were able to form. And the berries are really quite distinctive. They're very um, red and bright and generally see those in, in the late fall and winter. Another invasive species that a lot of folks, especially volunteers are dealing with in Metro Vancouver are the ivies. So we actually have English and Irish ivy in Metro Vancouver. And you really can't tell the difference if you're just using, using your eyes to look. You'd have to use a microscope to look on the underside of the leaves in order to distinguish between the different species of ivy. Um, and definitely invasive, the most harmful thing that ivy does is impact trees. You can see the photo there that ivy was growing on the ground and then it started growing up the trees and it can be damaging to trees in a number of different ways. Um, and so one of the priorities is to remove it from trees and then try and get the stuff on the ground as well. A really common plant that you can unfortunately still buy in garden centers and nurseries. Um, and so there's a bit of a, a catch up that needs to happen with the horticulture industry because unfortunately many of our invasive plants are still readily available for sale and it's not illegal to buy them or to plant them on your property. So um, and educating your neighbors and people in your life about invasive plants is always a great thing because when, when more people know, then more people can do better. And sword fern, one of my very, very favorite ferns that is really common in Metro Vancouver. Um, and it's a, a lovely native fern that um, is quite large. It grows in kind of these big um, bunches where you have the, the leaves or the fronds coming out from the very center. Um, and this, this plant has been here for, for many, many hundreds of years. And it's uh, again, utilized by indigenous peoples and has a lot of cultural value. Um, and, and many purposes. So um, of course there are hundreds and hundreds of plants that we could cover, but we only have an hour tonight. So I just picked some of the ones that I thought would be most common that you might have seen. Um, but there is a lot more learning that you can do on plants that you'd find in your neighborhood or in your garden. Um, but next I wanna move to plant collection tips. So why do people collect plants? I mean, you might have your own reason for being here tonight and have your own reason for why you're interested in collecting plants, but here's some of the reasons I thought of. Sometimes people are collecting plants for research. Maybe they're doing a study on particular species, or perhaps they're doing a study of a site or a park or an area, and they need to understand what plants grow in that area. Um, sometimes if people are having trouble with identification or they're not familiar with plant identification, they might be collecting a plant to take it back to show somebody else later and maybe that somebody else can help them identify the plant. Um, taking a photo is another great way to do that, but sometimes collecting the real thing um, is the best way to do it. If I have trouble identifying a plant and if I couldn't get help from my colleagues, I would likely be collecting a plant and then sending it to um, somebody at the, the BC Royal Museum, for example, and that person might um, want to actually feel and see the plant and perhaps even use a DNA sample to help identify what the plant is. Sometimes people are collecting plants for a collection. So maybe for a school project or perhaps just for a hobby or for their own interest. Um, people are collecting plants for food and for medicine. Uh, people also collect plants for art, so art to display, but also perhaps to make something. Maybe they're using plant material to weave um, a basket or things like that. Um, and sometimes people are just collecting plants for fun because plants are really cool and, uh, and plants are a really easy thing to learn to identify and we see them every day and I think it's really awesome if people can identify a handful of plants in their own neighborhood. Um, these are some pictures here of 
uh, invasive species bake off that we had at our field house, our office a couple of years ago. So we invited people to come to our office. This was before the pandemic and people had actually harvested invasive plants from their neighborhood and then use those as an ingredient in various dishes that you can see in the photos there. So that was a really fun event that we did to help raise awareness of invasive species. And those of us that made food as part of that event um, actually collected and harvested and were collecting plants for the purposes of sharing food with others. So that was a really fun event that I really hope we can do again someday, but not this year. How can you get better at plant identification? Well, just like everything, practice, practice, practice. You can attend a workshop, which you're already doing, but besides this one, there are lots of different workshops and groups that you can join to get better at plant identification. Um, lots of also guided walks. Um, I'm gonna be doing a guided walk in Burnaby sometime in May um, to celebrate Environment Week. And um, when you go on a guided walk with somebody who knows how to identify plants, they can actually point out stuff along the way. And for me, I really have to see a plant in person in order to feel confident that I can identify it. Photos and drawings are good, but I feel like I have to see it in person. So if you can go on a guided walk and somebody can tell you what the plants are, that's really helpful. You can also make friends with a plant person. If you have somebody in your life who knows uh, plant identification skills, um, go on a walk with them and point stuff out and, and they can help you figure, figure out what they are. Um, I also encourage you to learn to recognize plants in all the growth stages. So this is a, another picture of giant hogweed, that plant I mentioned earlier. It's actually a really toxic plant that you would not want to be collecting, but it's a good one to know how to identify so that you don't come in contact with it. Um, when it's flowering, it's really easy to identify because it's tall and it has these huge um, umbrella shaped kind of white flower heads that are quite distinctive. But when this plant first emerges from the ground in the spring, it looks a lot like a lot of other plants emerging from the ground. And so um, I encourage you to, once you start to learn how to identify plants, pay attention to what they look like throughout the year. Um, I do a lot of plant identification with dead plants or parts of plants because people are taking pictures when the plants may not be at their prime. And, and that's still really helpful to know how to identify things in those stages. Get help from an app. There are actually lots of apps out there. Maybe you're using some of them already and they can help you. So some of them um, require a smartphone and they use the camera and you can take a picture of a plant and then you submit it in the app and then it'll cross-reference your photo with uh, probably millions of different plants around the world and it will try to match up um, the closely related plants. And um, I've used some of these apps myself and some of them do a pretty good job of identifying plants. Some of them like iNaturalist actually use um, other community scientists, people just like you in other parts of the world. And you could submit your plant photo and then other people will offer suggestions on what they think it is. And so these are really great tools um, that will in real time help you identify things when you're at the site. And so those can be, be really, really helpful. Why not get help from an app? Most of these are free, although they have uh, maybe a limited number of use, like you can only use them a certain number of times before you have to pay. Um, a couple other websites I suggest there as well can um, help with plant identification. And again, all of these links and suggestions I'll include in the follow-up email after the workshop today. Um, using a local plant ID guidebook is a really great suggestion. You can get these from your library or you can purchase them at many um, bookstores. Um, so some plants like the plants of coastal BC, the plants are arranged by plant family and other books like the one on the right, the trees, shrubs and flowers to know in Washington and BC are arranged by flower color. So there's a ton of different ways that these books are often arranged. You can pick and choose what works best for you. The Plants of Coastal BC um, has actually a few different names um, depending on whether you're from Washington, Oregon, or BC, but that is one of my very, very favorite books ever. Um, and it is a, a plant book that I bring with me when I go camping and hiking. It's always in my vehicle. Um, and it's been one of the, the greatest resources for me as I have learned to identify plants over the last few decades. And also that whole series from Lone Pine Publishing offers 
plant ID guides for different regions. So there's a plants of Southern interior of BC and there's also plants of Northern BC. So again, depending on where you're from, you wanna seek out a book um, that is designed for your location in particular. All right, so um, now that we've moved on from some of the tips on how to identify plants, I'm gonna focus a bit more on um, kind of what we need to know before collecting plants. So you really wanna be confident about your identification before collecting. Like I'm talking 100% sure. You need to look really closely at the plant and pay close attention. Um, this plant in the photo here looks like an amazing, beautiful plant. It's very closely related to many other different kinds of plants, but it is highly toxic. It's called poison hemlock, and um, it's not something that you would want to be touching um, at all or collecting. And so you need to be able to uh, determine that any plant you're collecting is not that plant or any of the other toxic plants that are out there. Um, so before you do any collecting, you need to really do your homework and be very, very confident that you are collecting the plant that you think you're collecting and, and you've got your identification correct. There are also some safety and sustainable harvesting tips that I have. So first consider your impact. When we are collecting or harvesting plants, of course there's gonna be an impact because we are removing a plant from the environment. So there'll be some impact. You need to consider what that will be. Um, Lori Snyder, who is a local um, herbal medicine and indigenous plant expert, who I highly recommend you take a workshop from um, or a guided uh, walk from when, when the time is right. Um, she's a really, really great person to learn from. What I learned from her when I did a workshop is never take the first plant. So you don't want to take the first plants of something that you see at a site. Never take the grandmother, which is sort of, you know, the main kind of mother plant, maybe the largest plant, maybe the ones with the most seeds or flowers, and never take more than 10%. And I think that's really good advice um, to collect plants sustainably. And of course, never take more than you can use, right? Just take the bare minimum for whatever your use is. Um, you also don't want to collect certain types of plants. You don't want to collect plants that are endangered. Again, if you have some plant identification skills, you will know what some of those endangered plants are. If you have a guide or some kind of app, um, often those kind of plants will be flagged. And so you'll know um, if they're endangered or if it's a species at risk and, and you don't want to be collecting those. Some of our invasive plants or other weedy species are, are actively under chemical control. Um, and so you don't want to be collecting plants that might be contaminated or are um, under herbicide control. So one of the ways that you might know that if you see a sign like the one on the screen that's um, notifying the public of a herbicide treatment, those are things that you want to pay attention to. They'll usually say the specific plant that was treated. So again, if you're familiar with what that plant looks like, you'll know that that site is not a great place to collect that plant. Um, also, you might find signage at a site that um, perhaps a group of plants or um, a certain area at the site um, is part of a special project or maybe a research project or there's um, fencing that is excluding people. And so pay attention to those because those would not be good plants to, to plant either if people are using them for another purpose. Also, if you find that plants are being actively used by wildlife, so if you see a lot of pollinators on a plant or if you see a bird nest on a plant, those are not good plants to collect. Find another time of year that's better or find another patch where you don't see any wildlife actively using those plants. Other legal and safety considerations. So of course you always need permission from the landowner. The easiest thing to do is to collect from your own balcony or from your own yard or from, um, from your landlord. Um, but if you're collecting anywhere else in nature, technically you need to have permission from the landowner, whether it's um, the city or, or the province or something. Um, always wear gloves and outdoor clothing. It's really best practice for any time you're doing anything outdoors to protect yourself from the elements is wear long sleeves and, and wear gloves. And certainly if you're handling plant material, I highly recommend that. Um, just like you probably know people in your life that react really strongly to a mosquito bite. And then there's other people that don't seem to be bothered at all by mosquitoes. It's the same thing with plants. Sometimes people will touch a plant, even a, to even a plant that is not toxic, but they might get a little bit of a skin reaction and other people have no problem. So if you're not really sure what kind of response your skin might have to touching a plant, it's best just to wear gloves and, and protect yourself in that way. 
Also, when you're collecting, be aware of other environmental hazards. Are there bears in the area where you're collecting? We do have bears and cougars in our area, even though we're highly urbanized. Um, so you need to watch out for that. Um, watch for the terrain. Are you on a stable slope? Are you in an area that's going to be safe for you to stay for a while while you're collecting the plants? Road size are generally not a great place to be collecting plants, partly because a lot of the emissions and dust from vehicles will get on the plants, so they're not the, the best samples to be collecting anyway, but road size for safety issues are, are generally not a good place for you to be. Um, just be aware of property boundaries as well. Again, you don't want to move into private property and be inadvertently collecting um, plants in an area where you don't have permission. And if you're harvesting anything to eat, just be really extra cautious um, that, um, yeah, there isn't any contamination or any other, um, you know, pesticides or things that might be impacting the plants that you're, you're collecting. So how to collect, um, you want to use clean tools and again, uh, wear gloves. Um, and again, because we know that we do have invasive plants in our area, we want to try and prevent um, the spread of seeds and plant parts. So try and contain what you're collecting as best as possible and, and just do as minimal disturbance to the surrounding plants as possible. Um, inspect the plants for pests, so maybe little mites or other insects or diseases or blemishes. Um, generally, if you're collecting plants to eat or whether you're collecting them for your own purposes, you generally want to have a really good sample. So you want to avoid um, samples that have those you know, blemishes or maybe there's um, certain insects that have been eating the leaves and so those might not be um, the best choice. You also want to collect the, a sample that's as representative as possible. So when I was a student and I was collecting plants, um, the more you look at plants you realize just like humans, even plants within the same species can look a little bit different. Sometimes leaves are bigger or smaller. Sometimes there's a little bit of variation in the color of the flowers. And so when you're collecting a plant, especially as part of a, a collection or to demonstrate to other people what a plant looks like, you wanna pick one that looks like most of the others. Um, sometimes if you find a plant that looks really unusual, you might wanna collect that because it's really cool. Um, but if you wanna collect to show other people or to represent what the species looks like, you wanna collect one that looks a lot like the others. And you wanna collect as many of the plant parts as possible. And so um, spring and summer is a great time to do plant collection because as well as collecting the stems and the leaves, usually you can collect the flower or a fruit and those are really helpful as well. So collect as much of the plant as possible. If it's a smallish plant, you can even dig it up out of the ground and collect the roots. Professional herbariums or professional plant collections always have as much of the plant part as possible, including the roots. Even for tall plants, they have creative ways of bending the plants um, um, to show them. And uh, for trees, that might mean obviously not collecting the whole tree, but perhaps collecting um, a sample of the leaves or a branch and maybe collecting a little bit of the bark as well. Um, and take note about the collection. So certainly if you're doing it for um, a professional purpose or for a plant collection, you need to have details about the date, and the location, um, but even just for your own use, it's really helpful if you write stuff down. I know if I don't write stuff down, I don't remember. Um, and even for the purpose of going back to the same site the next year, having information about exactly when you did your collection and where can be really helpful. So having that kind of annual documentation about where you're doing plant collection is really helpful. So I'm going to stop screen sharing in a moment and show you um, my technique for how I press plants. But once you've collected plants, um, there may be a number of different ways that you're drying them out if you're using them for food or for medicine. But if you are pressing your plants for, for any purpose, um, this slide will be really important for you. So my suggestion is that if you um, are in, in the field, if you're at a site, you don't necessarily have to press it right there. You can collect it. Um, and then seal it in a bag. Sometimes you don't want to bring your plant press or your phone book or whatever it is you're going to use um, with you. And so you can do that later when you get home. Um, you can use a professional plant press or you can use your own homemade version. You basically need three components to press plants. You need hard flat ends. You need something to absorb moisture. And you also can use newspaper or other kinds of paper to actually um, put the, the, the plants right into. So I'm going to stop my screen share and um, 
Isabel, I'm not sure if you know how to spotlight me, but if you're able to spotlight me, then I'll show up a little bit bigger on everybody's screen. But this is my plant press right here. So it is a plant press that, um, that you'd find at a university or you could also buy this online. It is a professional plant press, the right size and dimensions that you would use if you were making a professional plant collection. And so there's um, holes in the ends that just helps to dry all of the plant material inside. You can see there's a strap here. So once plants are put in the middle, you can use the strap to really cinch it down and um, really press the plants down as hard as you can. And basically uh, the components of the plant press again are the hard parts either end. So in this case, it's the wooden slats. Um, and then really great materials for pressing plants are stuff that you can mostly find around your house. So corrugated cardboard are great um, for ba basically absorbing moisture because they have holes in the middle, right? It's not a solid piece of cardboard. So it allows air to move around the plants and they will dry more quickly. And then I have um, a piece of newspaper in here where I am collecting my plants. So there's a bunch of plants in here that I haven't done much with. You can see um, some ivy that I had pressed a while ago. Um, and so you can see that it's totally comes out flat. Um, so I had collected a piece of a rose bush that is in our office yard a little bit earlier. And so what I did was I, I did put it into a bag. So my best tip for if you're collecting but you can't press or um, otherwise dry your plant right away, um, one of the best tips I found is if you just bring a plastic bag um, that doesn't have any holes, so shopping bag next might not be great, but some kind of garbage bag or here's a, a recycling bag I found. Um, here's my little piece of um, rose plant that I collected. So I literally just put it in the garbage bag, um, made sure there was a bunch of air in there, and then I just twisted it around. And really, I've been collecting plants, um, you know, for days on end and plants will keep really well in a plastic bag like this for at least a day. Um, and then when you get back to your house and you can actually pay attention to, um, you know, the details of how you want to press it, it makes it a little bit easier. So once I got back home, I'm taking it out of my bag. I'll put my plant press up again so that you can see. Um, so let's say that I've done all the steps that I mentioned earlier. I've collected a representative sample. My rose bush is not currently flowering, um, doesn't have any fruit on it, and I don't want to dig it up because it's a large shrub. So I'm just gathering a representative sample of um, one of the leaves here. Um, and so I've collected more than one leaf because sometimes it's nice to show when you're pressing um, what the back of the leaf looks like because there could be features on there that might be helpful for identification. So if I was going to press this, I would put it on a flat surface. I'm, I'm holding it vertical so that I can show you. Um, but I would put it down on my paper like this and I would probably turn one of the leaves over so that the underside of the leaves were showing. And you can kind of see there that it is actually a slightly different color. So um, these are all important things that you would want to see in a pressed sample afterwards. And it can be a little bit tricky and sometimes it's helpful to have um, another set of hands, but just try and um, press the plant as flat as you can. And so it looks as nice as, as, nice as possible um, into the piece of newspaper and then literally just fold the newspaper over top and then um, put on the other pieces of your press and put the top on and then cinch it up. But of course, you probably don't have access to a press like this, so you could use um, phone books or books, just use the newspapers and the corrugated cardboard, and then you could even press it on top of a table and then just put some heavy books on top and that will do the trick as well. It might take a few days for things to dry, depending on what type of species you're pressing. If they're really fleshy, thick leaves, it might take them many, many days to dry. Um, and then um, sometimes plant collections are as simple as that. Maybe you want to use your, your plants for um, some artwork or something like that. But what I do often with my press plants is I actually mount them onto sheets like this. So um, part of my job is to teach people how to identify plants all throughout the year. And of course, I can't bring live material in all the time. And so I like to have a collection of plants and what they look like throughout the year so that I can bring them to show people. So this is one example of um, one of my herbarium slides. It's just a piece of paper, it's a herbarium sheet. Um, professional herbarium sheets like this are actually specially purchased. They're acid-free paper that are 
specifically designed to have plants glued on them. Um, and this one here is Salal, and you can see um, up close there, that's my label. Um, so this is a, a plant collection that was done a number of years ago. So again, important to collect information about where you where you got your plant because these are the kinds of things that you might want to put on a label if you're um, making these kinds of sheets afterwards. So this is Salau. We talked about Salau um, earlier with the it's a native plant with the, um, the evergreen leaves and these flowers were at one time pink. Um, some plants press better than others. Some of them look great um, after being pressed. They look very much like they did in real life, but other plants sometimes especially the flowers, lose their color over time and they don't always look as perfect, but they're definitely um, still a great tool to be able to teach people what plants look like during different times of the year. This is another example of a scotch broom plant. It is an invasive plant. So you can see here that I had collected two um, different stems and I really wanted to be uh, showing the detail of the shape of the flower and so I actually chose to press a couple of the flowers individually so as well as having the whole plants glued on um, it's nice to be able to pull out a little flower there as well and the same thing could be done with any other feature of the plant that you want to show if, if the stem is really important or distinctive or any of the seeds or berries um, you can uh, press those parts um, on their own and then, then you'll have them ready. So I have, I'm lucky enough that I have a whole collection of plants like these, probably 50 or 100 plants, and I can bring this traveling herbarium with me when I teach people about plants. And it's a really fun way for people to actually see um, plants that were living at one time and plants that were collected in, in our region. I'm just gonna pop back to the slide. I just have a couple more things to share before we wrap up. So some other resources that I wanted to share, growgreenguide.ca is one of the most amazing resources from our regional district. It's an eco-friendly guide to lawns and gardens in Metro Vancouver, and there's lots of information about um, great plants to grow in your garden, whether you're container gardening on your balcony or whether you have a large space in your backyard and you're not sure what might grow there. They've even got gardening plans and all sorts of tools to help you design a really sustainable and, and useful garden. So I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, also, one of you um, had a question before the workshop about how to report invasive species. What do you do if you find an invasive species? And I'm so glad you asked. Um, so you can always contact me. You can send me a photo or let me know what you found and where, and I'll do my best to figure out um, what we're going to do about it. Um, but there are also a couple of free provincial reporting apps that you can use. So there's Report Invasive BC app or Report a Weed app. They basically do the same thing. Report a Weed only has plants, whereas Report Invasives has all the invasive species. And um, you can actually use those apps on your smartphone and in live time, um, make a report of invasive species, which is really helpful if we have the coordinates. So um, oftentimes the reports that come through these apps for Metro Vancouver get sent to me. And so I am tasked with following up with whoever's responsible. And it's really helpful if there's good photos and um, accurate coordinates. So you can actually take photos and write a description of the plant. And, and that's really the best way to report invasives. Um, I encourage you to keep in touch. So you can use me as a resource for anything plant related. I love doing plant ID by photos. I love a good plant challenge. So if you have questions about plants, you can send them to me. Um, you can visit my website for more information. Uh, like you, we're on social media. And so you can find more information there. And if you're super keen, especially on invasive species, you can also join our regional listserv to find out about upcoming events and job opportunities and local research and things like that. Just a reminder that the workshop today is actually part of a series, um, the Community Plant Art Series. And so the second workshop is all about photography and plants, and that's happening on May 19th. And the last workshop, which will be led by Isabel, who is on the call today, is a botanical illustration on June 16th. And again, those workshops will be recorded. So if you're not able to attend, um, they'll be posted in the same place that the recording for this workshop is. So those details will be easily available to you afterwards. But I hope that some of you will consider joining for workshop two and three. And um, if you have anybody in your life that's really interested, 
um, in, in, the, in this uh, topic, you can, you can send them to us as well. Um, so maybe Isabel, I could just get you to pop into the chat the link to where you can sign up for those if you haven't already. It's our um, events page. So iscmv.ca slash events. You can register right now for those. And again, a reminder, the workshop's being recorded. I'll send a follow-up message to everybody after tonight. It'll probably take us a week or two to get the video up and loaded, but it'll be posted on our YouTube. There's a screenshot of our YouTube there. So if you find that, you know you're in the right place. And then you'll be looking for the thumbnail with um, the, the video from tonight. And with that, I thank you for spending your evening with me. That is my direct contact information. And if you contact me after today, please remind me that I met you in the workshop. Um, I'd love to hear from you again. And my great, great appreciation to the Neighborhood Matching Fund at the Vancouver Parks Board, who has funded this project and made it possible for um, us to bring you these workshops. And also want to mention that the second part of this project is actually the development of a plant ID guide. So anybody who's attended the workshops or really any residents of the region are welcome to submit to us um, photos or drawings or even images from plants that you may have pressed to us for inclusion in this plant ID guide. It's essentially community artists like yourselves um, that are gonna build this community plant um, guidebook. And so the guidebook will be of um, some of the, probably some of the plants I talked about today and really some of the probably 12 to 16 of the common plants that you find in Vancouver and the Metro Vancouver region. And so um, I'll send you more details about how to get involved in that. But after the workshops are done um, in July and August, we'll be working on that guidebook. And then after the guidebook is complete, it'll be a digital resource that is available to anybody. So I'm hoping that people who are really new to plant identification will find the guide really useful because it'll only have a few plants. It'll only be the common plants and there'll be a variety of different different ways that we've captured the plants in artwork and in photos. And so it'll be a nice way for people to um, be able to learn. And so I, I hope that some of you will want to get involved in that aspect of the project as well. <laughs>